When you look around at all the different video calling platforms, you'll notice that they all have a lot of similarities. As most people have moved from working remotely and overall communicating mostly through video calls, there has been a huge market opening up for real-time engagements. Not only are video call applications getting more users than ever, but video calls are getting integrated directly into existing applications. Now, technologies like Agora are democratizing real-time engagement, making it easy for developers to add live communications and live streaming into their apps, even if their main focus is not video or audio calling. But there's a huge developer dilemma. Zoom, Google, Microsoft have all set a very high bar in regards to a user's expectations. So how do you create an experience that can meet that specific expectation within your own app? In this video, we'll discuss five different video call characteristics that if executed well, can provide for a seamless experience that rivals those offered by the companies. Now these first two characteristics are going to be very obvious, but we will dig into more detail for each of them. Let's start with the first one, which is user controls for the current user. Every video call needs to have, at the very least, an option to end the call, but it can be extended to provide all sorts of other user controls like mute, unmute, disable or enable the camera, and just be able to switch which camera you're using. When deploying a desktop, you should always assume that the user has more than one camera, so they will need the option to be able to switch those cameras. Allowing access to switch the camera isn't only relevant for actual physical cameras that are connected to the computer, but many users are now running virtual cameras such as Snap's desktop camera app or OBS's virtual camera feature. Then when we go to deploying to mobile environments, the users will also need the ability to change between the front and the rear cameras. iOS 13 also brought support for multi-camera capture on both the iPhone and the iPad. So now it's also worth considering adding a button to let the user activate both cameras. The other characteristic that is very obvious is that we need a way to see all the different users that are within the call and even see your own video at the same time. But this comes with a lot of complexities. There's a lot of features that you might take for granted from using other video call solutions. One example of this is a disabled widget. If someone is able to disable their video, you need to handle that state and show the user something other than just a random black square. Another big feature is whenever you're using a floating view, basically a view where one's video is bigger than the rest of the other users, you need to have a way to update the largest user based on different criteria. The most common options of updating the largest view is whenever a user actually presses the view that they want to see the biggest, or sometimes that they have an active speaker role where the user that is talking will be, become the biggest user within the call automatically. And all this needs to be handled within your app. Now, aside from the most obvious things like user controls and video view, there's usually a lot of little things you will find specifically in group video calls. These might seem like they are just extras within video call, but most people don't realize how useful these features actually are. For example, how many times have you heard this? Uh, hey there, boss, I think you're on mute. It's become a quote that seems to pop up multiple times a day and debugging what's wrong doesn't always go smoothly. Thankfully, the biggest video calling platforms provide a visual representation of the audio and video states to the other users so that you know before anybody even starts talking whether they're muted or not. Now, this allows there to be a lot less awkwardness during the call, and overall, it's just more effective as problems get solved quicker. Another little but very useful piece of information is the number of users that are in the call. Most platforms have a little user count somewhere on the screen. This gives the presenter information about how many people they are presenting to. And depending on the team size, this can quickly tell you whether all the team members are here or whether at least the majority of them are present. Now, this gives you a quick glance at whether you should start your presentation, whether everybody's ready for you to get started. It's such a little thing, but if you run into a situation where you don't have it, it's definitely annoying. Now, this next big characteristic is something that you might actually not notice because the only time you would ever notice is if it's not implemented well. This is the characteristic of video and audio quality. This is probably one of the hardest characteristics to get right, and it's so difficult that there's entire companies built solely on trying to solve this issue. The most important feature that will make or break your video call is having clear audio. And this is done using different encoding and decoding, but, but also with the ability to support falling back from full duplex audio to mono to maintain a clear and audible stream. Video is of course a very key part of video calls as well, since it's in the name. Now video quality is the most contentious feature amongst providers on the market. And to be honest, at the end of the day, the contention over video quality is not much about what's the max quality a provider can support, but really just how good the provider is at maintaining quality even under poor network conditions. Now consider a video stream with multiple users. When there's a single person broadcasting video, you have an expectation for the video to be relatively high resolution. But as more streams join into the channel, the higher resolution could definitely overload 
your CPU or GPU for no reason. And this would appear to the end user to be lag. Now let's keep going with this example and put some numbers to it so that we can better illustrate what's happening. If there's a single stream, a single user sending out on the channel, you'd probably want to have 720p video. This is because the video stream will be filling the entire screen. Now when you step it up to two users, you're no longer filling up the entire screen with one video stream. So you're filling it up with two parts and it's split in half. So you could probably drop down your quality to 480p. This is this drop is almost half of the video quality, but given the device is now processing two streams, cutting load in half helps minimize the increased load on the processor. As the channel scales up to four or more users, it's safe to also have the video quality from each sender. And as the number of hosts increases, depending on the way the UI is set up, the streams could drop down as low as 120p. As the live stream scales beyond four streams, there may be a shift in the interface where not all the video streams are displayed on the screen at the same time. Go beyond just adjusting the video quality when users join or leave the streams. Users expect when they have a poor connection that their app will drop to a lower resolution to support fluidity. In traditional HLS streaming, the protocol itself has things built into it for adjusting the quality. Now this last one is a bit more of an advanced feature, but it's definitely a necessity for some use cases. This is a way for the host to control the other user's audio and video states. For any implementation where there are users joining that might be random or unknown by the host, it's important for the host to be able to control them. If they are being disruptive in the call or inappropriate in any way, without host controls, you can't really do anything about it and you're just kind of stuck. There are also a lot of use cases that don't necessarily mean anything happened that's inappropriate. You just want to have more control of the users. One clear example of this is actually from an app that I built called Streamer. There's a link in the description if you want to check that out. For this app, we are live streaming to users both on Twitch and on YouTube Live. If you have a situation where you maybe have a guest panel of friends coming in to talk to you about specific topics, there are going to be guests coming into the stage and need to be taken off the stage and you need some way to be able to handle that. Now, most if not all of these features are pretty much expected due to the precedent set by companies like Google, Zoom, and Microsoft. Implementing these features on your own can definitely be overwhelming, if not impossible, but that's where Agora steps in. Agora's APIs support all of these features and give the developer all the control. And then the Agora UI kits take it even one step further by implementing all of these using all the best practices. If this is something you want to put into your applications, I definitely recommend you take a look at the Agora UI kits. They are very simple to use and have a ton of customization and they support all these features, including user controls, host controls, have great video quality, have adjustable views when people come in and out of calls and have all the call info that you would need with the simple configuration update. Now the Agora UI kits are supported by most of the biggest languages and frameworks and you can find all the links to every language and every framework that we support in the description. Now if you enjoyed this video make sure to like, subscribe, and share and thank you for watching.